Let us join in our prayer of illumination. Holy One, speak in us and around us as we hear your word for us this morning, through your scripture and through our time meditating together. May we be comforted in the places we need to be comforted and challenged in the places we need to be challenged. Help our eyes, our ears, our very lives be open to you, O Lord. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. Listen for the word of the Lord. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day, and that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's scripture has us stuck in the wilderness, right on a precipice looking back and looking forward. I've honestly been in this space more times than I can count in my own life and I'm sure many of you have as well, right in the midst of change, wondering if going back will just be easier and looking forward to all the hard work and unknown ahead. I've never been a person who enjoys change, and yet logically I know it also brings growth. I've had to force myself into it more than once. God has dragged me along for the ride more than once. In verse 3 of our text today, I can hear echoes of my own words from the Israelites to God. If only, they say, if only they hadn't left, if only they had remained enslaved where they had food every day, if only they hadn't taken this risk, they would be eating dinner right now. Theologian Dennis T. Olson puts it this way, Looking back and yearning only for the past sometimes seems better than taking risks in freedom and moving into a new future. Whether it is the Israelites being led from Egypt, enslavement, and Pharaoh, or many other situations we could name in our own life, being in the wilderness is a hard, hard place to be. It has us wishing for the past, even if we know the past was not life-giving because the future just seems a little too risky. I found myself often in this place of wishing for what was in the midst of this season of pandemic. Maybe you have as well. Wishing for everything to just go back to how it was. Wishing to turn back the clock, 
digging your heels in and resisting moving forward because the way forward seems too risky. How does God expect me to keep moving forward without being able to see my best friend in person? What does it mean that I might not see my own church family in person for over a year since I have a three-year-old who can't socially distance? Am I really going to keep doing my job without being able to use my face and hands to show compassion? So I began taking an even closer look at this wilderness scripture for this week and found myself drawn to verse 4. God is speaking to Moses and says, that food will be provided, and then give some specific instructions that the people will go out and gather just enough food for that day. Now, I'm someone who likes an entire big picture mapped out before me, and it wasn't until I struggled with infertility and pregnancy loss for years that I began to understand the spiritual practice of just enough. When things are lower than low, it is hard to pray for or imagine things completely better. You begin to pray for just enough, just enough light for the next step, just enough hope for the next day, just enough grace to keep getting through. God begins to implement this spiritual discipline within us. What does it mean to be given just enough and trust that it will get you through? So I have all of this ruminating in my mind as we come to verse 5, where for the second time in all of Scripture in the Holy Bible, we see reference to the Sabbath, taking enough the sixth day to rest on the seventh. Now in the beginning, God rested on the seventh day, and then here again, God implements this spiritual discipline of taking time to reset this was before the Ten Commandments had been brought down by Moses from God, and yet here it is already, this pattern, this rhythm given to us by God to reset. I've had these two ideas swirling in my head in the midst of this wilderness season we are in. What would it be like to pray for just enough, to look for just enough, to be satisfied with just enough, and on top of that, with all the extra technology and cleaning, what would it look like to implement a Sabbath that is away from it all? I've always had excuses why I couldn't do Sabbath. As a pastor, I worked on Sunday. Preparing and leading worship is not Sabbath, so that day was out. Now my days as chaplain are a different type of clergy work, but I'm often on call and Screens feel like life in COVID, so I have continued to put it off. And yet, at work, recently, I've had several reminders of this calling back to a new rhythm. Staff members who've shared they are busier than ever and stressed to the point of not being able to concentrate. Family members and friends sharing with me that they aren't sleeping well anymore. Even clergy colleagues sharing that they feel so depleted they aren't sure if they are still called to ministry. And it has me wondering if we truly can afford to brush aside this scripture, this reminder, this calling. Abraham Heschel, theologian of the Hebrew scriptures, reminds us that God worked hard for six days and then God rested, performing the consummate act of divine freedom by doing nothing at all. Furthermore, the rest was so delicious that God did not call it good or even very good. Instead, God blessed the seventh day and called it holy, making Sabbath the first sacred thing in all of creation. If we are looking for the holy, we have been given access to it on the first pages of scripture, in the first stories we know. In this season that feels so chaotic and changing and fractured, our spirits are thirsting and starving for the holy. Barbara Brown Taylor speaks on Sabbath in one of her chapters in An Altar in the World and shares that, according to the rabbis, those who observe Sabbath observe all the other commandments. Practicing it over and over again, they become accomplished at saying no, which is how they gradually become able to resist the culture's killing rhythms of drivenness and depletion, compulsion, and collapse. In other words, Sabbath is the starting point 
for practicing, observing, and holding to all the other commandments. The American society as a whole has been built on valuing productivity. So Sabbath is literally calling us to something countercultural. Collecting just enough instead of hoarding is calling us to something in contrast to the values of our nation. Refusing to participate in consumerism for a short period of time every week feels almost impossible in a country that is constantly advertising that we need more to be considered enough. I will be really honest that I have never practiced Sabbath in any true capacity at any point in my life. I've never spent a day or even honestly a specific time frame a week just existing and reveling in that existence without screens, without buying, without my lists. I'm wondering though if this might be my time. My family has seriously begun conversations about how this might look, probably not for a full 24 hours because we are so far from that as a family at this moment but for part of a day, and we've begun blocking that off in the month to come. It could look different for each one of us as we find ways for the sacred to keep breaking in during this time of change and unknown. Maybe for you, it looks like being split up as an hour each day where all screens go off and nothing productive happens. Maybe it is one night a week. Maybe it is just setting some real limits on your calendar this is important to note, not adding more unless you take something off. I truly can't speak what this might look like for you. That will be part of your creativity with God. I can say with a bit of confidence that probably each person listening could benefit from some intentional Sabbath setting as we create a new rhythm to value the life we have been given to value this moment, to value that indeed we have been given enough. So hear these wise words from Barbara Brown Taylor as you consider this invitation to Sabbath in your own life. She says, test the premise that you are worth more than what you can produce that even if you spent one whole day being good for nothing, you would still be precious in God's sight. And when you get anxious because you are convinced that this is not so, remember that your own conviction is not required. This is a commandment. Your worth has already been established, even when you are not working. The purpose of the commandment is to woo you to this exact same truth. You are enough. In this busy wilderness season where everything needs to be done differently, you are enough. Even if every day feels differently, God has already claimed it and called you beloved. May we live into God's culture rather than the chaos set before us. May we set some boundaries May we value existing. May you find gratefulness in having just enough. And may your rhythms become attuned back with God as we allow the sacred in together. Amen.